I'm doing a Q&A this week um, on questions that people have sent me about their art, about setting up a business and everything. And I just thought it'd be quite a nice um, a nice thing to do as a podcast, just to do a, a little bit of a Q&A, give you a bit of information um, around, well, anything that anybody's asked me, basically. Um, so I'm going to start off with some some colour uh, questions and and this one here is what's the best colour recipe recipe for deep chocolate brown this is quite an interesting colour I have to say and obviously there are thousands and thousands of colour pencils loads and loads of different makes of colour pencils and lots and lots of different hues and shades for me my personal favourite is um, or my personal favourite recipe is using a a combination of browns reds and blues particularly for like a, a deep chocolate brown i find that chocolate browns actually do have quite a lot of blue in them and and actually when we look at anything it has a spectrum of color in there and and a lot of the time um colors are missed out and we end up having things that either become too warm or too uh or too cool so if you look at a, a, a black dog for example many many people use lots and lots of blues in their black dogs it's, it's a lovely lovely color to use under black to create really really rich colors however what tends to happen is we go a little bit too far with those blues and the dog becomes a blue dog and if we're talking realism we really do want to get the blacks coming out and many people are a little bit scared of using black and actually with color pencil it's a very very useful color to use it darkens everything it brings out the richness on its own it's flat but used with other colors it's brilliant so the best my best recipe for for a deep chocolate brown i would start with something like um a walnut brown a polychromos walnut brown i put that down as a as a as a layer and then I would incorporate into that Caput Morton Violet and Dark Indigo. You've got some lovely warmth then from the from the Walnut Brown and the Caput Morton Violet. And you have the richness that comes, comes through from the Dark Indigo. Because those two other colours are very ready, they're very warm in hue, um, you're not going to get any sort of sludgy greeniness that you would get if you mixed it with something that was a little bit more yellowy. You've got to be quite careful when you're mixing your colour pencils. Cause we mix them on the paper. Um, not to kind of bring blues in with your oranges and yellows if you're not wanting green, basically. Um, so that would be my, my best recipe. I would also then kind of sneak in uh, on the odd occasion, just, you know, if you've got like a very, very rich chocolate brown but you've maybe got a few highlighty bits in there i'd sneak in a little bit of um, burnt sienna is a really good one to bring in there again it's quite a, a warm ready color and then i bring in some blacks over the top just to deepen areas but that would be my favorite recipe for uh, deep chocolate brown um i've got another question here so which pencils do i use um i i like to use all of the pencils um <laughs> uh, but i have my absolute favorites so it's very difficult for me to say which is my which are my favourites, uh, because I I tend to have um, certain certain particular pencils that I absolutely love and I really wouldn't want to be without. But I think at a push I'd have to say if I could only own one set of pencils I think it would have to be the Faber Castell Polychromos. It's a really good set of pencils. They're generally highly light fast. They've got a fantastic range of greys. Really really good range of um, those animally like colours and they work with most other brands of pencils as well so my polychromos are a definite favourite luminance again I, I don't think I could do without when I first got when I got my first luminance I didn't really understand what all the fuss was about people were saying oh they're the Rolls Royce of pencils they're absolutely amazing and I didn't really kind of get what what it was all about because to me they were a bit weird and they didn't really work like my polychromos do. And actually that's because all pencils are different. Even pencils within the same brand are different. And you just have to find out the best way of being able to work with them. Um, so the luminance are relatively soft, really good for blending and they have the most fantastic colours. Now, colour for me isn't 
an important factor as such. But when you're looking at bringing in subtle shadows into like an orange, you know, chestnut horse or, you know, some kind of an orangey chestnutty animal, the colours that the luminance range have, particularly the violent, the violent, the violet toned ones are perfect. And I haven't found anything really that that is as good as them. The 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 Derwent Lightfast um, have got some pretty good hues in there. But I, I find that the Derwent Lightfast pencils don't always work they don't play particularly well with my other pencils. So I, I tend to leave those. If I'm going to use them, it'll be quite sporadically. Um, whereas the, the the polychromos, the luminance, and then the Pablos, again, a, a pencil that I use uh, very often, they are, again, a, a really super, super pencil. They're quite velvety when you lay them down on the paper. They've got good coverage. They've got generally good light fastness. You have to be a little bit careful. They're not, they're more of a, I wouldn't say they're a student grade, but they're not nearly as high quality as the as the luminance. But they have some really, really special colours in there. The granite rose that I use um, all of the time. Uh, the cocoa, another really great colour. And they just, they lay down on the paper very, very nicely. They're a good, they've got a really good, rich pigment. All three of those pencils I use on a regular basis. And then I pop in um the Karen Dash uh, Museum Aquarelles I love those but I use them dry I don't use I don't use them wet uh, I like I love the white and I love some of those more sort of earthy tones in that range I think they're great and then I also love the Derwent drawings they're the they're the really big fat pencils very very big fat core very soft and their black their um, ivory black is the the blackest black is a fantastic black really really good pencil so those are the those are the brands that i use on a on a regular basis so this is an interesting um question are base layers always necessary and i guess what i would say is well whatever layer you put in first is going to be your base that's probably being a little bit pedantic but um, I'd say no, they're not always necessary. When, when we're creating something or when I'm creating something, I will lay down a base of colour um, and those will be my base layers. Those are layers that don't have any details in them. They're purely down to get my uh, tonal values down in there, the, the idea of hair direction um, and, and, and colour. The details then come on the top of that. I'll work the details in once I've got those layers in. Now, depending on what surface you're working on, it may be that you actually need to have quite a lot of base layers down first before you start putting your details in. Or it might be that you just need one layer down before you start putting your details in. So if we look at pastel matte, which is my favourite surface, I use it for the, the majority of my um, commission work and I, I do have a lot of tutorials with the uh, on the pastel mat. If we look at pastel mat, you well, it depends on the quality of the pastel mat that you've got, and the quality can change. Um, I use the board, and it tends to be smoother, which I love. But you still have to get quite a few layers down if you want some really really nice fine details. Uh, but again depending on the subject that you're drawing if I'm drawing a white animal on white paper then I might not need an awful lot of base layers I might I could just go straight in with detail if I needed to if, if I was using lighter colors um, and and my surface was quite smooth so in that respect I don't really need a huge amount of layers however if I was working on a white dog on a dark piece of pastel mat I would need a lot of layers to go down to cover the tooth uh, to get all of those values and everything in and then I can go in and bring all of those details on the top if I'm working on drafting film um, I might be able to just go straight in with the details because there's no tooth to speak of on the drafting film and I could just go straight in uh, with my details so you might not need base layers in there at all and the same is for sort of hot press I find that base layers are quite important on hot press again it might feel smooth but there's still quite a lot of tooth in there so getting those base layers in is more about covering that tooth creating a really good tonal um, sort of base that you can then bring your details in on the top and then we've got um where's the best location to sign your art front or back definitely the front 
Definitely the front. If you're signing your art on the back, I'm 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 going to be questioning your belief <laughs> in your own work. Um, you know, if you're putting your your name on the back, why are you doing that? You need to, you need your signature in there. You need it uh, so that people can see that you've done this fantastic work, and you need to be incredibly proud of it. So always, always on the front. A little tip when you're if you're not quite certain where to put your signature. Um, if you create your signature on a piece of acetate, so just get a, like a, a you know a clear piece of acetate and and draw on it with like a sharpie or something, and put your signature on there, normal size that you would usually do. Then if you've got a drawing and you're thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure where to put my signature, bring the acetate onto the top. Watch that you don't have any static because you don't want to pull any of your um, you know your pencil off or pastel or anything like that. And you can just slide your a piece of acetate over the top of your drawing and you can work out where your signature fits best um okay this is a this is a funny one <laughs> how are you able to manage a lot of pets i'm i'm a, i'm making an assumption that you're talking about my dogs and my cat um but how do i manage them they they they're just part of the family they they're there all of the time they're all here now all fast asleep they know as soon as i come in and i get my microphone out and everything they just go to sleep um they're they're part of my family i absolutely love love my dogs um they and people might not agree with this or anything like that but they all sleep on they sleep in in my bedroom um and in when i wake up in the morning they're all on the bed and i'm squashed out at the side of the bed um and I never used to have my my dogs in uh, sleeping in the same room as me. And then when we got Vincent, um, <laughs> it was just a nightmare. And he wouldn't he wouldn't sleep downstairs. And he was screaming and howling and everything. And I was just like, oh my god, I'm just going to put him on the bed. And I put him on the bed the, the second night, I think, because we'd had the most horrific night. Um, and he wouldn't go in a crate um I'd never crate trained dogs before and then when we got slipper we crate trained her because I had quite a um a reactive rescue um Zach if anybody remembers him um and I, I needed slipper to be safe when, if we went out or anything like that um so we crate trained her and she loved her crate she really loved her crate and she was very happy in there um oh gosh apart from the times you know when they end up sort of pooing in the night and they don't tell you and then it goes everywhere and they're just sitting there in the morning you know the babies who go into their nappies and smear everywhere <laughs> slipper was like that anyway um so when we got when we got Vinny, i was like he tried to put him in a crate oh my god honestly he's the stiffest dog in the whole world it's like he's just like got rigor mortis um so we couldn't get him anywhere near a crate so i ended up just putting him on my bed and um and he just slept he didn't, he didn't get up in the night or anything. He just cuddled up and he just slept on the bed. And by that, at that point, he was a little puppy. Now he's a 40 kilogram, um, enormous dog. Uh, I mean, really tall. He comes up to just above my waist. Um, and it takes up the whole of the bed, but there's no way I could put him anywhere else because he just, he, he just shrieks. Um, so yeah, so they all sleep on my bed. So that's how I manage them. They're always with me. Um, and, and I love that. I, I absolutely love having them with me. I, 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 you know, it's brilliant. And Peggy the cat, she's very easy. She's a house cat. She's always been a house cat. I'm quite happy she's a house cat because we've got quite a busy farm road in front of us and the neighbours sort of three down lose quite a lot of cats on the road. So Peggy's a house cat. She's got the whole of the house to roam around in. Uh, basically lives on the kitchen table um, and, and sleeps most of the day. <laughs> um but um yeah so she's no she's no trouble uh, apart from when she's sick and what have you but um yeah so that's the, they're very easily easily managed the 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 girl the girls slipper and nelly they are group they go to the groomers every sort of five to six weeks we keep them quite short they're newfoundland cross um standard poodle so they they their hair gets very long it doesn't shed but um it can mat quite easily um so they, they their hair is kept quite short which they're they're very happy about um so yeah um yeah they're they're all they're all very happy dogs and i, I love having them around um okay next question um how do you draw the graphite outlines freehanding or with graphite paper okay so there's a there's a 
uh, there's an awful lot of different ways to be able to get your outline down. If you want to work with an outline, there are a lot of ways of being able to do that. You can buy transfer paper. Um, I used to use something called Trace Down. Um, it quite, I find it quite messy and I find it a bit, I don't like it on my fingers. I don't, that's one of the reasons why I don't really like pastel. Uh, I can't use pastel anyway because I'm allergic, but it kind of gets on my fingers and it goes a bit, it's a bit weird, feels a bit weird and it can be quite messy, but it's a good way of, you literally put a print out your transfer paper, the paper that you're going to be using on the bottom and you can just trace round if, if that's what you want to do. Um, you could just print something out put graphite on the back or pastel on the back, flip it over and trace over that. So that transfers it. You you could, um, a lot of people will freehand their, so what I wouldn't recommend is taking an expensive piece of paper, freehanding your, if you're going to freehand an outline, freehanding your outline on the expensive piece of paper, I wouldn't recommend that because what's going to happen is you're going to do a lot of adjustments. It's going to be a lot of rubbing out. I don't know anybody who can just do a perfect outline of everything just just like that. I, I mean, if you can, you're amazing. Um, usually there's a lot of adjustments. There's a lot of measuring to try and get everything in the right places. Um, so what I would recommend if you're freehanding an outline is to do it on a separate piece of paper that's not an expensive piece of paper. Do all of your adjustments and you're rubbing out. Get it perfect, whatever. Get it to the way you want it to be. And then you can then transfer that onto your drawing paper. So then you can put a piece of transfer paper underneath that or you can put your graphite or your pastel on the back of, of your actual drawing. That way you're not ruining your lovely expensive piece of paper with lots of rubbings out. Now, when I freehand, I don't freehand an outline. I don't I don't naturally draw an outline. I start with the eye and I work out. That's how I freehand and I I kind of measure as I go. Um, if I'm freehanding, I'll use wing dividers um, and I'll just use my eye. And that's kind of how I, I tend to work naturally. And that's how I did all of my first, probably my first year of pieces was done like that. And then I found it obviously when I started teaching it was much easier to that's a very difficult way to teach so I find it much easier now to have an outline created that we then colour in <laughs> and of course we don't colour it in because we have to be able to draw we have to understand perspective we have to understand all of the different elements and how an animal works and values and and you know everything like that so anybody who who sort of thinks that you can take an outline and then just colour it in and end up with a masterpiece um yeah no you're not you're wrong <laughs> um so now what i do is i actually create my outlines on um on an ipad so i'll create a digital outline that i can then give to my students as a jpeg and they can then use that if they wish or they can create their own um but um and then then what i'll do is i will project that outline for me to start my drawing so i will now start with an outline um, it's quite a basic outline. I, I tend to rush it. If I'm if I'm putting the outline down on a on a piece, I'm doing a piece now that's eleven by fifteen, it took me about five minutes to put my outline down. There's bits missing, it's all sort of pretty vague. Um and then uh, you know, obviously I kind of work freehand and with my eye when I'm when I'm um when I'm colouring it in, if you like. Um yeah, so that's that's what I do there.